Hey everyone, you're with Matthew, you're at the hub, and you're in the matrix. I'm still here with Kevin Kling in this segment, continuing our discussion about living with a disability. So in the other segment, we talked about how you were born with TAR syndrome, mm -hmm. right? And then 18 years ago, your landscape changed again. But before that, at that time, as the time before your accident, what were you doing like in your performing and career? Oh, uh, yeah, I was a playwright, and um, I'd done two plays, performed two plays off-Broadway and traveled the world as a, both a playwright and a performer. It plays mostly. And, um, yeah, so I was, I was steeped in theater. It was a really... So tell me a little bit about the two plays. First one... First one I did uh, off Broadway there it was uh, called 21A. It was about a bus in Minneapolis. It was eight people on a bus. I played all of them one at a time. So they'd have a conversation. One would start a conversation. It would be 45 minutes or an hour later before you'd hear the other half of the conversation because I had to get through seven more people to get there. And they all talked to each other on the bus. And the last guy robbed the bus. So it was the same 10 minutes. The last guy robbed the bus? Mm -hmm. And you knew it was coming because every scene ends with a gunshot. So you know that guy's coming, but you don't. And so finally, after you work through all the people, you find out the guy and why he robs the bus. And that went all over the world, that, that play. So when, always with you performing it? Mm -hmm. so, so when was the last time it was performed? The night I got in my accident that I was on my way to perform the play. You're so I was me. on my way to perform that play when I got in my motorcycle accident. Holy crimes. Yeah. That's a fact I didn't know. So that's the last time, and so you never will perform that again? I might. It's a hard one because... If we could a, raise a whole bunch of money, would you do it? Yes. I want to freaking see it. <laughs> it was a good... There's it, a thing we got to raise money for. It, Kevin Klingon, that sounds like such a great play. It really It went well. You know, who knows? You write stuff, and you never know what's going to stick. And that one did. It, I, is it online anywhere, do you I think? Hope, I hope not. Damn it. So I have to wait for that one. All right, so what was the other one? The other one uh, was called Home and Away, uh, and I started that one at Seattle Rep, and it, it was a storytelling show, one-person storytelling show, mm -hmm. and that ended up at Second Stage Up Broadway, and uh, that was another one that went, it went all around the world. All right, so you're driving. The last time that was 21A was performed, you're going to. What happened in the accident you're talking about? Uh, a car, I was in an, coming through an intersection and a car didn't see me and he turned right in front of me and I didn't really even have time to touch the brakes and I T-boned him and, uh, and then I woke up a few days later in the hospital. And what had happened to your arm? Well, what uh, happened all over this quick little... Uh, my lately. nerves were avulsed, which means my, my nerves were pulled out of my uh, spine from my arm, so I lost the use of my right arm um, and brain injury. Um, my face, uh, that... Well, the nurse in the hospital said, I probably wouldn't have brain injury because my head used my face as an airbag. <laughs> so my, all my sinus, everything crushed into the car. And, um, I'm sorry to laugh. No, no, the, I thought it was... Back to the humor thing. Even then, I <laughs> kind of laughed. What, well, what could be perceived as a laugh. And, uh, but but it, it, it really, that is true. But So they did uh, this special... This guy, wonderful plastic surgeon, did reconstructive surgery which I really was lucky uh, um, at HCMC, the doctors that I had that helped really did put me back together. So this arm got pulled out, so it mm -hmm. went from very functional. Oh, yeah, and yeah. And being the arm that did a lot of the work in your life, right? It did everything. Yeah. I hardly ever used my left arm. <laughs> so no, I've never asked you this question, but I'm trying to imagine the turnabout in your whole, I mean, obviously the practical things of having your, quote, not as functional arm become your main arm, right? I mean... I wish I could say it was a rough transition. It really <laughs> went smooth. I, and I know there's a lot of things that I get frustrated because I can't do, right. but it has nothing to do with the shift. My left arm was like waiting in the wings. It was like, Ready it to was do like never do let your understudy on because it's <laughs> going to do a better job. And it did. It just jumped right in. Never let your understudy on. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that one is just one of those lines that for me is going to be timeless. <laughs> I'm never going to see your arm the same way. That's it is. the problem. It's the understudy that it's comes on and does a better job. And then the guys, like, the director calls you and says, I think you're still sick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Moving on. 
Um, so, but along with your, your injury, um, you have all, like all sorts of kind of pain, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I guess they call it phantom pain. Yeah. But when you're in pain, I don't. I, that really disturbs me because it's not phantom. It's not phantom. It hurts. At all. It yeah, hurts. yeah. And, and and they call it phantom because they can't figure a causal mechanism. For right. It, right. And as the doctor told me, he said, uh, "Your pain will be ever present and intermittent," which seemed <laughs> contrary. I know. Seems contrary. But then I figured out what he meant was it will always hurt unless it really hurts. <laughs> So that's how I say it. Oh, so we're having to laugh at this because if you take this in, and by the way, I'm laughing not because I'm not sensitive. It's no, I, I know, know you know. Yeah, exactly the wisdom of what you're saying. No, right? I know you. There's know. everything. Yeah. Something always hurts, and then it really hurts, and yeah. that's the distinction. Yeah, that's. So I hate going into doctors' offices and go, "What's your pain scale today?" It's like, what does that even mean? I Relative know. To what baseline? Well, when I talk in front of doctors, I said, I'm never going to get things above a two in pain. You know, I'm going to tell you some things, but we won't go over a two. So I'm easy on the doctors when yeah. I talk. Yeah. And does anything you do help? I mean, you wear a sling some of the time, some of the times you don't. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, we were talking earlier. It's, a lot of it is inflammation. A lot of it is things, stretching uh, help. You know, mm. just a kind of, you know, I've got to, you got to have better maintenance, you know? It's like older motorcycles, you know? You just need more maintenance. And so that, that, a lot of that is just being conscious of that. And, um, yeah, sleep, everything, stress, everything makes a difference. And it totally you does. hate to say that because you want to live your wild, carefree lifestyle. But it um, changes, yeah. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you had said in, in the previous segment that when you were a kid with, with the, the arm that's in the brace, um, the understudy. I'm going to start calling him the understudy. <laughs> no, he's not the understudy. Um, that that by the way people talk to you, you could learn things. The rhetoric around that. Did you notice the similar or different changes as an adult when the other accident, when other injury happened to your shoulder? The change. Oh, yeah, where this arm a- a- after the motorcycle accident. What kind of changes? Well, what in the way people to? perceived you. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, you know, but it was more how I perceived me. I think I was always perceived as someone with a disability, but I never perceived myself that way. But now I do. I suddenly started perceiving myself as someone with a disability. And I never, I don't think, ever referred to myself as someone with a disability. With it, just with this, this arm. arm. And now I do. So you entered our ranks with the motorcycle accident. Kicking and screaming. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, but, it, but now I, yeah, now I definitely... Uh, associate myself with someone with a disability. So one of the things that Kevin and I like explore together, and we do it in a workshop called Body, Mind, Story, but we're definitely interested in exploring the relationship, the transformative healing effect of story in relationship to your life path, but also how it affects your body. So that's part of our work together. One of the things that really struck me, that it's a story you tell in our workshop, is... is um, when you, you know, with the phantom feeling, some, you've had some PTSD with this, right? Right. That's a mm-hmm. sleeplessness, yep. some frustration. But one of the things that was transformative for you was when uh, a therapist took you through the coming upon that car. Right. And dot, dot, dot. Say what, say what that, that exercise was. Well, there's all kinds of different therapies. And luckily, they all work to some degree for me. EMDRs mm-hmm. worked... Um, uh, acupuncture, all these different things. But with post-traumatic stress, the one, one of the things that she did was through a series of exercises, she had me actually get up in a room and walk as if I was on my motorcycle and instead of hitting the car, going around it and keeping on going. And the oddest thing, I slept that night and anger issues dissipated. It was really phenomenal. And uh, what it, I, the only way I can think about, about it is the, whatever myth inside of me that said I had the accident was shifted somehow. And I mean in a very deep place, in a place where uh, it really had a, a physical effect. I always tell people, you know, stories help you heal, but I always thought it was anecdotally, and this was more than anecdotal. This was really actual, a physical dif- a physiology that happened that was different than I was before. And so, but I wake up and I still can't use my right arm. So deep in my mythology, I miss the car, but in reality, I hit the car. So I have these, this paradox inside of me that has to find a way to talk back and forth 
because neither one of them is the reality. I need one reality to go to sleep at night, and I need the other reality because that's the world I live in. And so I use story, the arts, a lot of things, so those worlds can coexist even though they disagree. Yeah, there are a couple of things like, hey, if I weren't composed, my jaw would be down again, <laughs> like guffawed, but I want to pick a couple of things apart in what you just said, right? Okay. Um, first of all, I think it's a brilliant way to say the myth, my inner mythology about your accident. That's something that everyone, everyone in the audience does that's gone through anything. You have the way you represent the story to yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's not just anecdotal. It's not just a story. It's literally how you wear it on the inside. It's deeper than consciousness. It's deeper than, which is a level that story can reach. Yeah. But not necessarily the way you describe when people ask you when you've been injured. Right, you tell what happened. That's not the level we're talking no, about. No, you can only describe a myth by another myth. You can never describe another myth through logic, through any kind of sense. Mm -hmm. Only another myth can explain a myth. Yeah, so that whole idea that we all carry different versions of that, I think is a very yes. powerful universal truth. I agree. You don't have to have gone through something extreme. Um, but the other, so that, that is something just the, the, my inner myth shifted, or however you said it earlier, really struck a chord with me. The other thing that, that I'd like you to say a little bit more about is that, like, and, and you said it in this term, is like you went through an exercise where you then, and you might say, imagine you didn't hit the car, but we're exactly saying it's more than imagination. It, yes. Talk about that a little I bit. I think that's the reason she needed me to get up and actually do it. Move your body. Is that, yeah, that then somehow, and, and it wasn't as simple as that. This took weeks of, you totally. know. Totally. And she also said, since I'd been telling stories for so many years, I'd already done a lot of the groundwork, and I'd already been telling stories about my accident. So a lot of things she would have had to get me to I'd gone through in front of people. I mean, just going through as, as I was telling the story. And so um, it, it, it was based on a lot of going through the story a lot of times. But then I needed that element of matching the physical with, with whatever that is that was deep inside, whatever that is that she talked to me about before. And it's like even when you do EMDR, there's a series of questions and they're lined up in a way that, that get your brain working in a way that then when the light is going back and forth, it does connect you know, the, the halves of your brain or however it works, I'm not even sure. But I know that it's, you don't just jump to where, you know, to, to where I was walking around the car. She did really have to, um, to guide me there in a professional manner. Yeah, the, the thing is I think we're at the juncture of why your and my work intersect is that the, exactly the level you're talking about, that you're talking like the inner mythology or the level that's like below your understanding mm -hmm. or somehow deeper in, that is also the level that I think yoga gets at. Oh, yeah. I but agree. not everyone's going to be a yoga student. So I started gravitating towards your work mm -hmm. because I think they're touching a similar place. And in terms of healing, something that, you know, one of the things I love that Kevin says is that stories or myths um, don't explain the mystery. They connect you to it. Right. And so anytime you've gone through some big trauma, loss, or disability, it's a, it's a mythological event because it's hitting so many levels of human consciousness. Well, you have to be careful as a storyteller when you're telling trauma stories, especially personal ones, because your body will do the same thing as it did when it happened. And so you will lock up, you will do things that your body, because your body knows what to do in that state of trauma, and it will do it again. Part of the thing about turning it over and over and over, and I would work with like Feldenkrais and Alexander methods and different methods that helped you take, have your body realize the story. So sometimes your mind is outside the story and sometimes your body is outside the story. And so that you can get them talking back and forth instead of riding the same ride, one out of control and one in control. I just love that line again. There are lines that there's gems here coming. Sometimes your mind is outside of the story and sometimes your body's outside of the story. And you've seen that both in, in, in people in the audience where someone's relaying and you've even noticed yourself, you're telling the story of something that's really painful for you, but you're not exactly experiencing it. That's when your body is outside of the story. Yeah. And you're, you know, there are all different versions of that, which I think is like in storytelling, when they start to all come, come together, that's what's what happened in that office that day. And when they can talk to each other. Yeah. Instead of, yeah, instead of beholding to each other. Yeah. So I, I think that the other thing is I just want to, like, reiterate is that, is that it wasn't just your imagination that missed the car. This is one thing that you and no. I share. 
It's, and, and, and is that I think that, and this is true for everyone in the audience too, I think that we carry all of our times in all different life paths. There is a story that was here but not here where you miss the car. Mm-hmm. And when you, you say oh. that so beautifully, when you say at night I need one, you need to have missed the car so you could sleep. And then you wake up in the morning because your arm doesn't work, you have to be in the other story. And we do this all the time with transgressions in our lives. We adjust a transgression so that we can sleep. Yeah. I mean, we do it all the time. And that's part of what, what in this segment we want to point out is that, that when you think of different things the way it could have happened, like I think about when I broke my leg doing yoga and I could have done something different, part of me had to like let in that I did not break my leg and I broke my leg in order for me to, over, to deal with the fear that came with practicing yoga. So I think that this is one I, of those... Yeah, here's one. I'm going to jump on that. Is yeah, that okay, please. Matthew? Yeah. I, the, resiliency is defined as maintaining one shape. So when your shape has been compromised, like when you do break your leg, how do you maintain your shape? How do you maintain yourself when your shape has been compromised? And that's when you have to fill that in with story. What do you fill that in? What, how do you maintain a shape that's not there anymore? And that's why I say family, faith, community. I say it like through, through your story, you are the same person. And then over time, your story takes that shape of that. It's, it's the, the idea of you have to grow into your new shape. You aren't that shape when it happens because you can't be. You're still the old person. So you have to grow into your new self. And you do that by filling that in through your, through your story, through, your, through exactly what you're talking yeah. about. And until you can become that new shape that you are. So in order to tie that back up, um, in a way, having you miss the car Mm -hmm. was a reclaiming of, not reclaim, but your shape. Because you both hit the car and missed the car, and your shape of what you are and who you are is both. Until I could grow into myself. Until you could grow into the next step. Dang, it sounds like heavy stuff, but if you think about this and you feel it a little bit, you know what we're talking about. You know the things that you've survived in your life, good and bad, and know that you do tell stories and your stories about them keep emerging and changing. This is part of what it is to heal. This is part of what we, I believe we're story seekers more than knowledge seekers. Oh, people? Yeah, we're, we're a narrative creature. We're a narrative creature, yeah. and that's where we're going to stop this time in the matrix. Hey, I'm back. If you liked what you saw, there's more coming. To keep up with new releases, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on your notifications. 